As uh, you heard on the video, Amanda Good grew up here at Chapel Street in our student ministries and our church family, and we are blessed that she's actually here today. So Amanda, would you stand up real quick so people can see you? And the ministry that she serves with in Rwanda called Hope for Life is now part of our Serve the World initiative. Uh, this is the, the fund that we um, promote throughout the year that we use to support uh, local and global ministry partners, and now Hope for Life is one of them. We want to help them double their facilities by building a new home so that twice as many boys can be cared for there. So uh, you can participate in that anytime by, uh, by giving to serve the world. And you go to your Chapel Street app, press give, and they'll lead you right through the process. And then later in December, we're going to have a more focused, specific time of raising funds uh, for Hope for Life. So just pay attention as we go forward. And Amanda uh, has been here all morning, and she's here for the next couple of weeks. So you may have a chance to meet her there as well. Well, I want to start with a little bit of fun today because uh, it's Christmas time. And so we're going to play a little Christmas game. Uh, I'm going to ask several questions about your personal or family Christmas preparations. And you, uh, there'll be points associated with your answers. And you have to keep your point total in your head or use a little card or something. And you're on your honor system for points, all right? Because there will be prizes that are in this bag right here at the end of our game. Are you ready? Okay. How much of your Christmas decorating have you already done? If you have already have your Christmas tree all set up, raise your hand. Okay, okay, good. That's a good place to start. You get two points. All right, two points for having your Christmas tree set up. Uh, if it's a real tree, not an artificial one, but a real one, give yourself bonus two points. If you went, <laughs> if you went out and cut down the tree yourself at like one of those Christmas tree farms or forests or whatever, okay, how many did anybody do that? Cut it down yourself. Okay, you get bonus five points for cutting down your own tree. Now, if you went out and cut down the tree in your neighbor's backyard... Not good. Subtract five points because you're not loving your neighbor. Okay, uh, if you put your tree up before Thanksgiving, subtract five points <laughs> because that is a violation of international Christmas law. If you have your exterior lights or decorations set up already, how many? Give yourself two points. If you have an inflatable in your yard, I won't make you raise your hands, subtract two points for each inflatable. That's because there's a house in my neighborhood that has six inflatables in their yard. Okay, what percentage of your Christmas shopping have you done already? How many are 100% done? All, all done shopping. Okay, if so, give yourself five points for planning ahead but then subtract one point for making the rest of us feel bad, okay? If you have more than 50% done, but not all the way done, give yourself two points. If you have not even started yet, I won't make you raise your hands, not even started yet, uh, you get one point for being honest, okay? Just being honest. How many of you shopped on Black Friday, went out and braved the crowds? Give yourself two points for the courage to brave those crowds, but then subtract one for giving in to cultural peer pressure. <laughs> How many of you shopped on Cyber Monday on your computer? All right. You get two points for being tech savvy, but you subtract one point for being lazy. Oh. And then how many shopped on Small Business Saturday? I didn't even know that was a thing. Small Business Saturday, anybody? I'm going to give you two points for that. It's a good thing. Bonus. How many gave something on Giving Tuesday? Oh, yeah, that's good. We're going to give you five points for giving on Giving Tuesday. Final question, how many of you are coming to our worthy musical presentation? You got your tickets already, you're coming. Okay, and you give two points for yourself and every member of your family who's coming. Okay, now, how many have already invited a friend or neighbor to join you for worthy? You get 10 extra points because that's the point. Invite your neighbor. Okay. Now, total them all up in your head. How many, anybody have 20 points or more? Raise your hand. High enough so I can see you. Okay, 25 points. 26. Just drop your hand when I get to the number that's above your total. 27. 28. 29. 30. Okay, the 29s and 30s, all of you come up here, you get a prize. Come on, big, big hand of applause. Come on. 
I hope I have enough. Okay, you guys all get to wear this throughout the service. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Okay, we have a Christmas Pez dispenser or candy cane full of M&Ms. Candy cane? Pez or candy cane? Ah, there we go, Pez. You don't care? Okay, just reach in and grab one. There you go. Yep. So you three guys cannot ever say you didn't get anything out of this sermon. (laughs) You just did. So today marks the beginning of what Christians all over the world call the Advent season. Advent is a Latin word, adventus, that just means arrival or coming into view. And really the entire story arc of what we call the Old Testament, you know, the 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 first part of your Bible, the strange, wild, and woolly Old Testament, the entire story arc of the Old Testament can be understood as preparation for the advent, for the arrival of Christ into the world as God's promised Savior. Now, we're today beginning a four-week series called, And He Shall Be Called. We're reaching back 700 years before the birth of Christ, so 2,700 years ago from where we live today, into the prophet called Isaiah. Now, you need to know at the time of Isaiah's writing, things were not good for the ancient nation of Israel. They were under pressure from these um, invading enemy people groups, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, uh, which ended in some destruction sometime later. And so Isaiah chapter 8 actually ends with this verse. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. They will be thrust into utter darkness. Now the prophecies of Isaiah are directed specifically to the ancient people of Israel. But there is a broader horizon of the prophecy's meaning that actually speaks to us today and even things that have not yet taken place. Um, He writes of darkness, distress, fearful gloom, and that, that does sound familiar to us today. We live in a world that's also filled with bad news, with lots of darkness, war and terrorism, conflict, uh, racial conflict, domestic violence, all this kind of stuff we read about every day. Uh, It's a very contemporary piece. Isaiah could have been writing today. But then beginning in chapter 9, where we're going to be dwelling today, the prophet's tone changes, the message changes. Listen to what he says in verse 1 of chapter 9. Nevertheless... There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, this is what we call a messianic prophecy, meaning this is looking ahead to the coming of God's promised one, the one who would bring deliverance, hope, and peace. The ones Christians believe was fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. Now, if nothing else, you're going to see clearly today that what the prophets talked about 2,700 years ago came to be in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Isaiah and the Old Testament are all preparing us for the coming of Christ into the world. Now, we're going to continue in chapter 9. This is where we will spend our focus today. He writes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So the first thing we see in this ancient piece of prophecy is that Isaiah tells us a son is given. A son is given. The birth of a child is really a rather everyday occurrence. If you look at it this way, in America every day there are 11,000 children born, roughly. In the world, some nearly 400,000 children born every single day. So it's an everyday thing. But in another way, the arrival child of a child into a family uh, via birth or adoption is, is a life-changing event, a completely life-changing event. First, there's the expectation. We even refer to pregnancy as expecting. 
Then there's preparation. You have to paint the nursery and, and buy the crib and get the changing table, the bottles, baby clothes, all that. Then there's the actual trauma of physical birth, which I've been told is not an easy thing to go through. Then there's change. Change. I remember uh, when we were anticipating the birth of our first son, we were, of course, filled with uh, expectation and excitement. But uh, I think that somewhere inside me, I kind of had an assumption that we would just kind of keep living our, living our lives and include the new addition, you know, into our lifestyle, like getting a new TV or a toaster oven or something. Not, not quite. About, took about 72 hours to realize that everything changes. Your sleep patterns change. I saw a little article just today that people, families are now hiring sleep coaches for their babies. We didn't have a sleep coach. Uh, finances change. Priorities change. But the greatest change was an internal change. It was joy. The prophet says, For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He's talking about the coming of the promised one, the Messiah, the one God said would change everything. And if we jump ahead to the New Testament, we see clearly that Isaiah was talking about the arrival of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, we read this. When Jesus heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So Matthew himself applies the prophecy of Isaiah written 700 years prior directly to Jesus of Nazareth. Isaiah says to us three things about the son. First, a son is a gift. For to us a child is born, a son is given. Now, many of you have already finished your shopping or done a lot of your shopping, but almost all of us are going to give gifts at Christmas time. It's just what we do. We rack our brains and search obscure websites looking for the perfect gift for people we love. I did a little searching of my own. I found um, a bunch of little suggestions, lists. For example, I found a, a site that said 121 best Christmas gifts for kids. And one of the things on there was giant stuffed microbes. I had to do a double take. Like not stuffed animals, not stuffed doggies, a stuffed microbe. Like what does that look like? I don't know. Or a bow and arrow set that shoots only marshmallows. Such a thing exists. 34 awe-inspiring gifts for girls, including dog breed socks. 51 great gifts for dad. One of the things on that list is a smart electric toothbrush. It actually tells you when to move it from one side to the other, which kind of tells you what you think of dad, right? <laughs> and we give gifts, don't we, in order to express love. That's why we give gifts. When God considered his gift to the world, a world enveloped in darkness and gloom and distress, he chose to give the gift of his son. Most famous Bible verse of all time, we all know it by heart. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. His one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So the Son is a gift, and the Son is a gift that will bring light, the prophet says. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. We jump ahead to the Gospel of John in the New Testament. John writes, in him, Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone that's coming into the world. A son is a gift that brings light and life and therefore hope. What kind of hope? Again, New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one Isaiah was talking about. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So you put all this together. Jesus is the son who was promised by Isaiah the prophet, by God, is the son that was given, the son that brings living hope, a gift that changes everything. That's the first point. The son is given. The second point is the son is also named. The son will have a name. I don't know if you've noticed, but 
over the recent, I don't know, 10 years or so it seems, choosing unusual names for children has become kind of a thing in our culture, especially in the celebrity world. I did a little looking up names, had some fun with this this week, for example. Actress Gwyneth Paltrow named her daughter Apple. She's like 15 now. I thought, that's a sweet name. (laughs) Star football player Cam Newton named his son Chosen. He explained it because he said, I would have named him Cam Newton Jr., but I didn't want to put that pressure on him. (laughs) So he named him Chosen. Kim Kardashian named her daughter North, which maybe wouldn't be a problem except for the father's name is West. So technically, that would be Northwest. <laughs> Actress Tia Leone named her son Kid, K-Y-D, which means every time someone yells, hey, kid, he has to turn around. Did she think about that? One of my favorites, singer Jermaine Jackson named his son, and I'm not making this up, named his son Jer Majesty. <laughs> Hello, Jer Majesty. Hi, Jer Majesty. Jer Majesty. Maybe because he wants him to have good self-esteem. I don't know. But my absolute favorite, former heavyweight champion George Foreman. A lot of you know this. George Foreman has 12 children by five different marriages, five sons, seven daughters. All five of his sons are named George Foreman. (laughs) Junior, the first, junior, the first, wait, junior, second, third, fourth, and fifth. All George Foreman. And one of his daughters is named Georgetta. I think George likes himself. But... Sooner or later, all these parents have to answer a question that the kids are going to ask. Why did you give me the name you gave me? They're going to have to explain. Because names are important. Names tell us something about ourselves, where we came from, who we are. The names Isaiah gives this son are even more significant because they're also titles. They're titles for the Messiah. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today we look at the first of those names, titles, Wonderful Counselor. Now when we hear that phrase, Wonderful Counselor, we think of uh, maybe a favorite uncle, a favorite teacher in school, kind of a Mr. Rogers kind of character, just a wonderful person. But it's more than that. When we use the word wonderful, we mean something really nice or pleasing, like this apple pie is wonderful. But the ancient Hebrew word, pele, is a much stronger word than that. It means a miraculous beyond comprehension, extraordinary, and almost always is used to point to the power of God himself. Psalm 78, for example, in the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders, same word, in the land of Egypt. What were those wonders? Remember the plagues that God sent on Pharaoh's Egypt to let the Israelites go? Remember the sea parted so they could walk on dry ground? Those are wonders. Mind-boggling power, imagination-busting power. So what is wonderful about Jesus? Let me mention just, just four things of the many things I could mention. First, Jesus had a wonderful or miraculous birth. Isaiah says two chapters earlier, chapter 7, therefore, again, 700 years before his birth, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now jump ahead to the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, the familiar story, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus was born in a wonderful, miraculous way, in order to demonstrate his identity as the Son of God. Second, Jesus had, did wonderful works, wonderful things. In Matthew 11, it says, Jesus replied, Go and report to John, that's John the Baptist, what you th- see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus' wonderful works, his miracles demonstrated his identity as the Messiah of God. Thirdly, his wonderful death. I stood next to two hospital beds this past week in which a person was lying who had just passed away and ministered to the family. It's a weird thing to say a death is wonderful. 
How was Jesus' death wonderful? First Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It's through Jesus' wonderful, miraculous death that we receive through the gospel new hearts through, through forgiveness of sin, new identity by being adopted as his children, new purpose by living for his kingdom, and new destiny that's eternal life with him. And finally, fourthly, through his wonderful resurrection. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit that lives in you. So by the resurrection, by his wonderful, miraculous resurrection, we can have and know the experience of new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the second part of the title, that's only the first part of it, wonderful. The second part is the word counselor. We think of a counselor as someone who listens well, maybe gives good advice. But again, the Hebrew word is much stronger than that. It means it carries more weight, more authority. Isaiah, a few chapters later in chapter 28, writes, All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, same word, whose wisdom is magnificent. A counselor with miraculous, magnificent wisdom. Matthew chapter 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You see it? All authority has been given to me. So Jesus is the counselor with magnificent wisdom who teaches with all authority. Secondly, Jesus is the counselor who is in himself the truth. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Thirdly, Jesus is the counselor who is our advocate. I don't have this verse on the screens, but in 1 John we read that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now, advocate in that sense means counselor in the sense of sort of a defense attorney, that one day we stand before the judge, God Almighty, and Jesus stands in front of us, says, this one is forgiven. This one I have paid the price for. He's our advocate, our counselor. And finally, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit as another counselor. John 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or counselor to help you and be with you forever. So in summary, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise made 700 years before his birth that he would be the son who is given, the son who would be the wonderful Counselor, the miraculous wisdom of God given to dwell with us and in us forever. And that leads us to the third thing we see in the prophecy the Son will rule. The Son that is given, the Son that is named, will be the Son that rules. History is full of examples of children who were born to rule. Some of you are better historians than I. But here are a few examples. Emperor Puyi of China became emperor in 1908 at the age of two years and 10 months. He only ruled for four years, forced to abdicate at the ripe old age of seven, subject of the movie, The Last Emperor, that some of you have seen. Henry VI of England became king of England in 1422 at just nine months old. King of England. Ruled for 39 mostly ineffective years, if you read history. Tsar Ivan VI of Russia became Tsar whatever that is, in 1740 at the age of two months. He was ousted just a year later in a family coup and lived the rest of his life in captivity. I'm sure wondering why. What, what happened to me? Mary, Queen of Scots, became ruler of Scotland in 1542 when she was six days old, ruled for 25 years, then was forced to abdicate, lived the rest of her life 18 years in uh, prison, and then was beheaded in 1587. Last one, John I of France became king the very day he was born in 1316. The only f uh, king of France who was king the day he was born and for his entire life, which lasted only five days because historians think he was poisoned when he was five days old and somebody else took over. So the reason for this little history lesson is that the son being talked about in this prophecy is different from all other human rulers. Verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. His rule will not bring injustice and violence, but rather peace. And it won't be temporary, it will be eternal. 
What kind of ruler rules eternally? He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is a rule bringing not injustice or political corruption, which is so common today, but rather justice and righteousness. Now, we need to see this is the part of the prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. So remember I told you the horizon of the prophecy was for Israel right at that time, then one that includes us today, looking back. Now this is looking forward because the time is coming when this ruler will return and establish an eternal kingdom that will never end. That's the promised second coming of Jesus himself. Jumping ahead to the New Testament, we see the prophecy confirmed, Luke chapter 1. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God familiar story. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So, here's the summary. The world is mired in darkness and gloom and hopelessness. It was in Isaiah's day 2,700 years ago, and it still is in our day. And maybe in some ways that darkness touches all of our lives in one way or another. And here's the promise. God promised 700 years before his birth that a son would be given, and that son now has been given. That son has a name, a title, the Wonderful Counselor, the son that will bring light and hope and salvation and will live with you and in you through the person of the Holy Spirit and will one day return to rule forever and ever in his eternal kingdom. That's good news. That's what we call the gospel. That's why we celebrate Christmas today. But there's one more thing, and it's easy to miss, and I almost missed it this week. So focused on wonderful counselor that I missed the last line of the prophecy. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Zeal is an unusual word. We don't use it much in English anymore. But it means ardor, burning passion, a kind of ferocious love. It's a word you'd use to describe why a father would rush back into a burning home to rescue a child. It's a word you use to describe a mother's heart as she sits night after night with a sick child, refusing to go to bed herself. Zeal. It's a great word. And this is the God of the universe looking down on all he created in love, on human beings created in his own image who are living in brokenness and darkness and pain and looking down on the sin of the world and in the person of his son coming into that world to save, rescue, and redeem zeal. This is the Son, the one who has been promised, the one who has come, knowing full well what the cross will cost him, yet willingly bearing the burden of not only my sin, not only your sin, but sins of the whole world, all of human history. So what's the zeal of the Lord Almighty? You. You are. And I am. What's the burning passion of God? You are. Your fears, your darkness, your pain, you are his burning passion. You are why the Son was given. The gift is for us. So in all our preparations, for all our preparations for the holiday season, for Christmas time, just know that Jesus is always has been, always will be, and longs to be your wonderful counselor. We close this morning with a remembrance that we call communion. We remember who Christ is, what he did as our wonderful counselor. And this table does not belong to our church. It belongs to the Lord. So if you're here even for the first time and you put your faith in Christ, please join us in taking bread and cup. Ushers are going to pass out the trays. There's two cups stacked inside each spot. Take both cups, hold on to them until I lead us through the remembrance of the Lord's table. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, the world is and always has been a dark place in many ways. We all know that. We read the paper every day. We see the images. 
Many of us are feeling something of that darkness in our own lives right now. But in your zeal, your passion, your fierce love, you came into our world through your son. And through your son's sacrifice, you give life and light and hope. And thank you today for the presence of the counselor you sent, the promised Holy Spirit, as we remember you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.